Achieving a higher standard of living for First Nations peoples is a priority for Canadian politicians and promises to this effect are made every election cycle. But the solutions don't seem to be coming that quickly. Our guest today may have some light to shed on this. I'm joined via Skype by Dr. Tom Flanagan. He's a senior fellow at the Fraser Institute and also the author of a book called The Wealth of First Nations. Good to have you with us, Dr. Flanagan. Uh, can you give us a brief snapshot first off uh, what your book is all about? Yeah, what I tried to do was to analyze evidence about the uh, level of prosperity that different First Nations achieve. You know, we have more than 600 of them, so we have quite a range of, of, of outcomes there to look at. So I tried to find, uh, using normal statistical methods, what factors are positively associated with higher levels of prosperity. So it's it's supposed to be an evidence-based approach to this issue of uh of well-being or standard of living, uh, try and find out what seems to promote better outcomes. So what's working, what's not working. So now in, for, uh, in order to do this, I guess, to determine how First Nations people are doing financially, there has to be some way to properly measure this. Now, can you explain to our viewers what the Community Well-Being or the CWB index is? Yeah, that's the yardstick that I used. It is, um, uh, a scale published uh, every five years after the most recent census. It's take data from that's uh, compiled by Statistics Canada regarding um, income, housing quality, uh, engagement of the labor force, and uh, levels of formal education. It can combine these into an index that ranges from zero to 100 with equal weighting of those four components. Uh, First Nations range from about 20 up to over 80. Um, they are on average about 20 points below the average of all Canadian communities. But there is a big range. Yeah, it is a very significant range uh, difference uh, there. So now, you know, I think viewers would be quick to point out that uh, federal spending on Indigenous people has grown exponentially over the last few decades. So one would think that the well-being of First Nations should have improved along with that, right? Well, one might think so, but the evidence doesn't really suggest that, uh, that that's happened. Um, the, the measured well-being of First Nations has been improving more or less parallel with that of Canadian communities in general, uh, even though much more money has been spent. Um, the, 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 the evidence suggests that the Canadian economy is sort of like a tide that puts all boats and the extra government spending, uh, as far as we can see, hasn't made a huge difference. Some, some First Nations have improved a great deal, but it doesn't seem to be tied to higher levels of government spending. Yeah, that's very interesting. Now, there are certain First Nations groups that do score well on this CWB index. So what are they doing that's working? Now, I understand that one of the factors is having long-term stable leadership. That makes a difference, as well as uh, apparently paying their chief and council, you know, properly, uh, but not in excess. Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a number of factors. You mentioned a couple. Um, Others are using what, uh, what I call off-ramps from the Indian Act. There's Parliament over the years has legislated a number of possibilities for First Nations to um, uh, have more control of their own affairs and to be less controlled uh, by the department. Um, these include such things as the First Nations Land Management Agreement, which gives them more control, decision-making over their reserve lands. Uh, the most extreme form would be self-government, which a few have done. Um, there's the ability to create property tax uh, on leaseholds on reserve, which generates income uh, for the ban. Um, so those are some of the, some of the possibilities. Um, generally speaking, the First Nations that make use of, the, use of these off-ramps are doing better, um, mainly because what they lead to is more when the jargon is called own source revenue, uh, revenue that the First Nation generates for itself by engaging in business, whether that means um, leasing of their land for uh, residential housing or shopping centers, or it could be exploitation of natural resources. It could be the entertainment and hospitality industries like casinos, hotels, golf courses, marinas, things like that. Uh, there's, there's a lot 
different possibilities depending on what makes sense in your location. But it's the First Nations that are using those opportunities that are, are measurably doing better. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be different, of course, depending on your location, right? So tourism in some locations that are remote, uh, you know, may not work that well. Uh, and you mentioned collecting, um, uh, you know, again, self-government, so collecting their own taxes and managing their own lands, that was a factor there as well. Uh, what, what difference would it make to collect their own taxes? Is that separate taxes, you mean, on, on leasing things or? Farm leases on leaseholds. Uh, that's, this could be either the band leasing out community land, like for a shopping center project, and then collecting property tax as you would pay property tax in Calgary Lethbridge if you own, uh, were using property for commercial purposes, or on residential developments. Um, some of these projects are based on uh, individually controlled land on reserves, uh, um, so-called certificates of possession which uh, are not common in Alberta, but are much more common in British Columbia. Uh, so there's different legal substructure, but the basic idea is that people using land would pay tax on it, just as you would if you were in a, a, an outside Canadian community. And that gives some uh, useful revenue to the, uh, to the ban. Um, probably the best example of achieving prosperity that way is the West Bank First Nation, uh, which has gone in for uh, land development in the Kelowna market on a, on a big scale. And they're collecting large amounts of property tax and other kinds of development fees and service charges and so forth from the about 10,000 people who are now living on the reserve through leaseholds. And that has uh, given them an elevated level of prosperity. So that's an extreme example of that approach. Yeah. Well, that's great to see. Another type quite different would be the Fort Mackay First Nation in Northern Alberta, which um, well, their leasing of land is only a minor factor, but what they've done is to create companies which sell services in the oil sands. Started with janitorial services, but expanded to workforce lodging and well site maintenance and haulage and cartage and earth moving and things like that. And they've become very prosperous. They're, they're uh, in of well-being is Canadian average um, and yet they've never produced a drop of oil they've done it all by selling services so there's different possibilities yes yeah, fascinating because that's a whole other area with uh, natural resources right some are sitting on some natural resources so that would make sense you, you're going to benefit from that but uh, uh, in this case you're saying just being close to it and providing services that's uh, it's a great way uh, to make it work for you but there seems to be uh, almost a tale of uh, two two tales here going on here at the same time some indigenous groups seem to be the ones protesting uh, you know oil development and so forth and others are saying hey it's here let's make the most of it so uh, there's quite a difference I would imagine economically in those two approaches yeah, there is a there is a division within the, the native community, and that shows up uh, most strikingly with respect to pipeline proposals in British Columbia, Trans Mountain uh, pipeline, uh, Northern Gateway, or the Coastal Gasoline Pipeway that will feed the um, uh, liquefaction plant at Kitimat. Um, majority of First Nations want to take advantage of these. Uh, they get substantial benefits when they sign on. But there are a minority uh, who are opposed. Now, ironically, some of the strongest opposition comes from coastal First Nations who have other opportunities. They don't really need the pipeline. Uh, there's a couple in Vancouver, for example, that are very opposed to the Trans Mountain Pipeline, but they've got uh, real estate development opportunities that are going to make them wealthy anyway. Whereas there are dozens of small, rather poor inland First Nations for whom the pipeline is probably the best chance. You know, the pipeline could become a lifeline, but they're being blocked at the moment by a combination of environmentalists and a few First Nations who perhaps don't need that particular source of revenue because they have other opportunities. I mean, this is one of the main findings in the book was in addition to what First Nations can do for themselves, it does make a difference where you are. Um, First Nations that are in metropolitan areas like Vancouver have, you know, economic opportunities that you don't have if you're uh, out in the middle of the Canadian Shield somewhere. Now, that's not the narrative you typically hear on mainstream media. We, we tend to hear a lot about the protests and so forth, but from your experience, from your research, you're actually saying it is a majority of First Nations peoples who would support natural resource development? 
Well, um, I mean, let's look at some evidence. Uh, the Trans Mountain Pipeline uh, signed up 43. Uh, they're actually, they're not technically all First Nations. It includes a couple of Métis communities and so forth, but, but let's refer to them as 43 indigenous communities uh, to support the pipeline. There were 12 that were opposed and went to court to, to block it. And uh, the protagonist there was the Slyle Watooth Band in, in Vancouver, which is one of these sort of other opportunities. So it's like four to one in favor of that one. The Coastal Gas Link uh, Natural Gas Pipeline um, got the support of 20 First Nations with nobody in opposition except for uh, an internal division within the Wet'suwet'en um, division between the elected chiefs and the traditional chiefs. And I don't know how that's going to turn out. Uh, Northern Gateway, we don't have a public listing, but it was pretty clear that there were dozens of First Nations that wanted um, Northern Gateway to go ahead too. So the evidence suggests that while there are opponents, that there's actually a far larger number of those that are willing to work with the uh, with the pipeline companies. Uh, and then behind them, you've got dozens of producing First Nations in Alberta and Saskatchewan that want to get the best market for their oil and gas. Uh, they may not have a pipeline crossing their own territory, but they want to be able to uh, sell their product mm -hmm. at the highest possible. Well, it's important to hear the whole story here, you know, and, and uh, I think m most of us as Canadians would love to see First Nations people prosper. I mean, yeah, we want to see this happen. So, um, and again, you're saying there are groups that are doing this, they're taking the bull by the horns and saying, here's an economic opportunity. We're not going to rely on, uh, you know, the government's handouts, if you will. And uh, and it seems to be working for a lot of these uh, uh, First Nations groups. So that's great. Well, it is. There are now dozens of First Nations that are generating uh, more than half of their revenue by themselves. They still get government transfers, just as the city mm -hmm. of Lethbridge receives mm -hmm. transfers from the province of Alberta, um, you know, because they perform governmental functions. And so they will always get some transfers from Ottawa. But, uh, you know, to take an extreme case, Fort Mackay generates over 90% of its own revenue from its business activities. Uh, and as I say, there are many, not hundreds, but there are dozens that are generating over half of their of their own revenue. Um, so, you know, what public policy should be doing is just try to encourage this process, uh, facilitate it, which in many cases means uh, just removing barriers rather than necessarily giving more money. Uh, it's, there are legal and political barriers like the barriers to pipelines, um, which in, are largely created by governments. I was going to just ask, what kind of feedback are you getting, positive or negative, from the indigenous community uh, to your book? You know, I mean, hey, you're, I mean, you're, you're, you're jumping into some deep waters here, right? Yeah. Well, uh, I guess the people who don't like it are ignoring me. Uh, <laughs> nobody's trying to uh, burn me an effigy right now. Uh, the Fort Mackay First Nation love it, love it. They, well, they want to buy some copies of the book to give away. Um, another First Nation called me after they read one of my earlier publications and invited me to come out and do a case study of them. So there's there's some receptivity out there. I mean, there is a community. There's a, a business-oriented community among First Nations, and I, I wouldn't call it the majority necessarily in terms of a really active community, but it's growing all the time, and um, it's very forward-looking. And I think uh, so. I think there is some receptivity. See, really, all my book does is to point out um, what First Nations are doing, the sometimes kind of complicated statistical methods that I use uh, don't represent my opinions. They represent a tabulation of what I find First Nations doing. So all I'm, all I'm actually doing is to try and make more widely known what the um, First Nations leaders are, are working out for themselves. Right, so it's less editorial, it's more matter of fact. Here's what's working, here's what's not. Let's learn from what's working, right? Okay, yeah, interesting. Yeah, so it's not Tom Flanagan saying, here's what you should do. It's Tom Flanagan saying, here's what I see some First Nations doing, and they seem to be getting good results for their people. Mm. Now, you make an interesting statement uh, that some may disagree with. I mean, you say attempts to rectify the past do not produce higher living standards in the present or the future. Do you want to unpack that a little bit? Yeah, I looked at several... Uh, couple of chapters in the book that are look at things like this. 
Um, a lot of our policy today under the heading of reconciliation um, amounts to trying to pay reparations for the past. Uh, we had, you know, the most uh, open examples, I guess, would be first the uh, payments for um, residential schools, which total cost of which is approaching $6 billion. Now the government is announcing um, payments for those who attended day schools. Um, so really what we're saying is that any First Nations children who ever went to school deserved uh, to be paid, whether it was, we heard how bad residential schools were, but now it's being claimed that the day schools uh, were equally bad. Um, you know, all this money is paid to individuals and maybe some are able to use it to buy some consumer goods, but it doesn't, it's not gonna show up in uh, long-term prosperity. Um, another thing I looked at, um, and this has relevance down in your part of the world near Lethbridge, uh, specific claims, which are claims for uh, that treaties were violated or provisions of the Indian Act were violated. I see that the blood have just settled a claim for 150 million, which is the maximum based on uh, management of their of, of their cattle 100 years ago. Um, maybe you know, maybe there's a historical justification for paying the money, but when I statistically analyzed. Um, how communities are doing that have received these settlements versus communities that haven't received them. I found no difference. Um, that, that is basically. absolutely fascinating that, uh, <coughs> again, the money yeah, itself billions. doesn't I mean, necessarily... Billions in this program over a period of 40 plus years, billions have been paid, and yet the communities that have received it don't have measurably higher outcomes than those that haven't received. So the one that seems to be, or the method that seems to be working is again, just to say, you know what, it is what it is. Here's the opportunities we have, and each band has a slightly different opportunity. Let's, again, take those opportunities, whether it's real estate or tourism or natural resources, make the best of it, and, uh, you know, they put their hands to the plow, and, and it's working for a lot, of, a lot of communities. So that's really what needs to be replicated, right? Yeah, that's the message. Okay. Thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it, Dr. Flanagan. My pleasure.